Um, so in Mexico, there, or in the Americas, there's this program called Parks in Peril. So essentially, we've got the park designated, and it's under threat. And so they essentially took uh, the full set of parks across the region, and they prioritized them based on the amount of threat. And this part of it, you know, again, I've spent too much of my life in, in Mexico, that part of it really bothered me. And I don't expect you guys to have the geography of Mexico under control, but I'm going to show you why. Okay, and it's again, it's one of these multiple criterion things. So I got some colleagues together and we prepared this paper and it was all based on two um, five taxon inventories that we had done. So this one, Sierra de Juarez, is in the eastern shield, looking towards the Gulf of Mexico. And this one, the Sierra de Atoyac, is on the western slope, kind of right above Acapulco in the, in the mountains. And you're going from lowland to highland, and lowland to highland. And these open circles, which you can't see perfectly well, but the open circles are species diversity. And so you see high species diversity in the rainforest, low species diversity at the tops of the mountains. Okay? And you can see that X pattern all the way through. And that's for birds, mammals, butterflies, reptiles, and amphibians. Okay? We can look at elevational distribution of species with restricted ranges. Again, here's the highest elevations, here's the lowest elevations, and notice that these curves peak in the middle. Okay? So we looked at range size of those species. And so here we go from lowlands to highlands, and this is the average size of a species distribution in terms of degrees of latitude. Okay? And what you can see is big, small, big. And essentially, you know, we, we looked at the distributions. These lowland species go from Mexico south to Brazil. And these highland species go from Mexico north to Canada. And in the middle, they tend to have small ranges. I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get down into the details of, of these, these, these maps and these priorities. Um, there was a synthesis book done in the late 80s, Biological Diversity of Mexico, uh, Origins and Distribution. This is actually one of my earlier publications, a geographic, ecological, and historical analysis of land, land bird diversity in Mexico. I hope I would come up with a better title these days. Um, but one of the things we did was to show a map of avian diversity and of avian endemism in the country. And you can see the exact same contrast that I just showed you in the graphics. In the lowlands, especially in the southeastern lowlands, you have high diversity, and in the interior you have low diversity. But endemism is essentially zero in the southeastern lowlands, but it's concentrated up in the mountains. You remember back to the Parks and Peril map, and I said there was something that was bothering me. Look at that. All of their, par all of their parks that are, that are important for conservation, according to them, are in the lowlands that have nothing unique about them. But if you take a donor in a canoe through a lowland rainforest, it's cool, right? And the interior highland stuff may be as important as you like, but it's not as exciting. 
You know, so, so this map is saying where are the species that are unique to that region. Now, notice, because I'm going to mess it up again with more information. So this is the Western Mountains, and you can see there's a lower um, endemism region along the coast. And then the Central Mountains, called the Transverse Volcanic Belt, and then the Southern Mountains. But there's always a coastal lowlands with low endemism on either side. Okay? Now we're going to go back and be bird taxonomists for a while. And so that same guy you saw at the right in the, in the picture, he and I did this essentially revising the species level taxonomy of birds of Mexico. And we took about a thousand species of birds and we reworked their taxonomy and we expanded them into about 1,200 species. And so we split the current species of birds of Mexico into two, three, four, five, six species. Because the taxonomy was very conservative, just as it is here in Africa, by the way. Um, and we essentially presented a taxonomy that everybody hated. In fact, we ended up publishing it in a tiny little journal in Brazil because nobody would publish it. Of course, now, 20 years later, we're about 70% correct about which of these deserved species status based on an overview. Um, but back at that time, we asked, OK, we now have the traditional taxonomy and we have our revised taxonomy. Let's go back and look at those conservation priorities. And so we're going to go back to those same maps. So biological species concept, I'll say evolutionary species concept now, OK? This is endemism. So this is just like the last map we saw. But notice that now we have quite a bit of coastal lowland endemism that we had completely missed in the previous uh, map. And then this is an even more interesting set of maps because these are single region endemics. So in this mosaic that we created, it's kind of biotic provinces for Mexico. This is the number of species found only in that single region. So you either get conservation right there or forget it. And notice that these islands were empty of endemism. Now they're full. Now they're the most endemic rich places in the country. Notice we still have coastal lowlands. So all I'm after is these priorities evolve as your knowledge evolves. So just to wrap up, it'll take me a few slides to wrap up. Conservation prioritizations are scale dependent. In fact, you could even argue that those conservation prioritizations that are a world map, they're useless. You know, they say, put your money in Kenya and not in Rwanda. I'm going to get you in trouble, Jesse. <laughs> but you don't know where in Kenya. You know, is it the mountains? Is it Lozans? Is it Savannah? Is it what? So scale dependent. A lot of what gets done in the conservation world is not based on science or data or evidence. The conservation decisions become more complex as perturbation becomes more pervasive. And then, you know, we could talk about climate change to no end, but we're not going to. But it reorganizes things still more. So let's go all the way back to the beginning of this talk. We had some indicators and we had some possible goals. And we don't really know which indicators are good, reliable um, 
indicators of what we're trying to achieve in the goal. We can guess at some, like probably species diversity maps on to conserving unique elements of biodiversity, but maybe not. Remember my, my trap that I set with you with the, with the ecotone? Um, forest cover may map quite well onto reducing climate change. So some of these work and some of them don't. But I just want you guys to be thinking about you've got to connect them, being sure that your metric, you know, the thing that you're going to measure or map or, or evaluate is indeed indicating something that's relevant to what you want to achieve. So, crucial to understand indicators and goals. Make sure that your indicators are reliable signals of the goal that you have. Um, I'll emphasize 20 times that solutions have to be multidimensional and synthetic. But we can come back around and ask, is there one set of six essential biodiversity variables that capture everything we need to know or that are enough to communicate? And maybe, maybe there isn't. Maybe for a bunch of goals, we're gonna need a bunch of indicators that are gonna go beyond just those six. So anyhow, this is, this is just a, Kind of a commentary to, to get you all thinking about this is a complex endeavor. This is a, um, it's a challenge that requires a lot of thinking and a lot of data gathering and synthesis. And frequently we have to put, you know, we can't just get started with what we have. Okay, question over here. By the way, we will be providing you all with um, copies of all of the presentations. So you don't, you don't need to worry. I should have told you about that earlier. But we, we'll share a folder with you that has you know, PDF copies of everything. Okay, you had a question. Can I, can I, can I know what we have to, to do in order to maintain our hotspots? especially in developing country where majority of people lives in extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. So what do we have to do to maintain biodiversity hotspots? Essentially keep them from losing species and being degraded. And especially when there are people who are poor and hungry and such. That's the central challenge. If, if there were a good, a good answer to that, then we wouldn't be so worried about biodiversity conservation. I think it's worth contemplating the different models of conservation that have been explored. So for example, there are some conservation organizations that basically just buy land, build a fence, and keep people out, okay? And so in the United States, we have the Nature Conservancy. And they do that sort of work. And in some cases, it's fine. You know, it's a completely unique stand of you know, primary forest in a place where there's no primary forest left or something like that. And in the US, you know, it may be more feasible because you don't have people in extreme poverty it may be feasible to say, no, this is a fence and you know, nobody goes in there. But probably here or elsewhere in the developing world, that solution doesn't work, right? If somebody is hungry, that matters more than you know, the integrity of some, some natural area. Um, and so there's, there have been a lot of attempts to integrate human presence into biodiversity conservation. So if you look at the biosphere reserve system, it's very interesting because it basically acknowledges that humans are part of the natural landscape. 
you know, there are places where there are more humans or fewer humans, but humans are part of it. And so that's, a, that's an interesting concept. I'm not certain that it's been a successful concept in terms of avoiding um, further perturbation to the natural landscapes. So I was involved in the surveys that created a biosphere reserve in southern Mexico back in the 90s. And I got to drive through that biosphere reserve this year. I hadn't been there in 20 years. And it really felt like it had gotten worse. Even though, you know, it's, a, it's supposedly a human and natural landscape and that the biosphere concept helps to um, find ways that both benefit. Now, where I've seen things be more successful is where there is a direct um, avenue for economic prosperity for the local residents. So I'll give you one example. It's a small scale example, but it's a reserve in Western Mexico where they owned, they bought 44 hectares, so that's nothing. Um, they built a field station there and they built some facilities for researchers to work. And they created a team of researchers and the researchers didn't necessarily come in with their own priorities, but instead they came in and integrated into the local communities and they said, what are your priorities? And so for example, the local people, not very much anymore, but the local people used um, a, a, a grass-like bamboo for roofing material, okay? And the bamboo there is in clones. And so, you know, a whole mountainside of this, this bamboo, which looks more like a grass, will flower and fruit and die. And the local people felt that this bamboo was declining in population. And so the researchers went in and mapped all of the bamboo in the whole mountain range. And they were able to figure out the fruiting schedules of each bamboo clone. And they were able to say, well, look, the place to go in and cut your bamboo is precisely where it's just died. Rather than where it's going to fruit and seed five years from now. Okay? And so they worked with the local people. This is called the Sierra de Manantlan in western Mexico. Uh, they worked with the local people for, for years and years. It's been 35 years now. Um, and after about a decade, they were able to sign agreements with the, it's not individual landowners, it's communal land own, ownership, but they were able to sign agreements with the local communities that this area is essentially a nucleus zone that is basically not touched. And this area is a buffer zone where, you know, subsistence hunting and gathering of this and this and this can happen, but not roads, villages, things like that. And then a still broader area was more open to a broader set of human activities. And so that was an enormous investment, but it's considered one of the big conservation successes. They protect more than 100,000 hectares and they own 44. Now, could you do that on a global scale? Probably not. But, you know, I would rather have a few successes than a, a bunch of dots on maps that are unsuccessful parks. So, no, I don't have a good answer to your question, but there are interesting examples. Okay?